Hello and welcome to this Brain Taxi virtual event featuring Peter Gizzi reading and in conversation with Ocean Vong. We're so glad so many of you could join us tonight for poetry. I'm Eric Lorber, the director of Rain Taxi. If you don't know about us, we are a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. We do this in a variety of ways, but our core has always been our quarterly magazine of critical writing. And this is our most recent issue. It's our 100th issue, actually. Uh, we're pretty proud to have hit this milestone. And if you haven't been able to see this yet uh, through your bookstore or get it in the mail, you can get it in the mail from us. So hop over to our website anytime after the event and we can set that up. Another way we try to serve the literary community is through author events. And most of them like this one are free to attend. But if you're able to pitch in a little something, we gladly accept donations. You can just use the donate button at the bottom of your screen. It's quick and easy. There's actually a lot of ways you can use your screen tonight to participate. Uh, many of you are already using the chat and we love to see that. It's a great space to express uh, joy and insights you're having and anything you wanna share, we'll try to chime in too with uh, useful information. If you have a question for the authors, you can use the ask a question box. And when I come back at the end of Peter and Ocean's conversation, I'll try to bring along a few of those if we have time uh, for them. Maybe the best thing on your screen, in my opinion, is the buy books button. And I know there are other places on the internet where you can buy books, but when you buy books at an event, you are directly helping everyone involved, the authors, their publishers, the bookstore, the event host, and of course you get to have the literary art come right to your home. Tonight, if you hit that button, you'll be taken to the page for Peter Gizzi's new book, Now It's Dark, at our partner bookseller, Majors and Quinn, here in Minneapolis. But you don't have to stop there. You can always get other books by Peter or books by Ocean or books by any author, in fact, and you will still be supporting literature in all the ways I just mentioned. Holding this book up for you brings to mind Rain Taxi's longstanding admiration for the work of Peter Gizzi. A little over two decades ago, we reviewed his second collection, Artificial Heart, and a few years later, we brought him to Minneapolis to deliver a stunning reading from his next book, Some Values of Landscape and Weather. It was no small thing to us. It was deeply inspiring to us, actually, that his visionary editing of Oblique Magazine and his passionate archival plunge into the work of Jack Spicer informed his sense of poetry, community, and what it could be. And since then, his writing has continually expanded the borders of the area he explores in books such as Threshold Songs, Archaeophonics, and Now It's Dark. You can tell even from the titles that this is an artist who explores liminal spaces places where it can be difficult to hear and see, but where the rewards of striving to do so are deep. If you understand, as Peter Gizzi does, that the act of paying attention is at its root an act of love. To help us navigate the world of this author tonight, we are blessed to have with us a writer who also fearlessly travels into difficult places, Ocean Vong. Readers, remember how you felt when you first read his extraordinary debut collection of poems, Night Sky with Exit Wounds, or his equally extraordinary debut novel, On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. If you're like me, your heart climbed out of your chest and traveled to your knees and your throat and your feet and your mind, and you became palpably aware that there was someone there helping, helping you to go deeper. That is the person who joins us tonight to celebrate his fellow poet and plumber of the depths. As I turn the microphone over to Ocean to begin our journey, I encourage all of you at home to clap or hoot or make a noise that makes you feel good. I promise you that somehow we hear you. Please welcome Peter Gizzi and Ocean Vong. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rain Taxi, um, for for making this happen to celebrate 
um, a poet who is very important to me and very important to many people. Um, I'm very lucky and blessed to call Peter Gizzi a friend and colleague. Um, and so when, you know, when Rain Taxi asks us to do this, it's a obvious yes, because Peter and I do this every week. We just, you know, hang around and just talk about literature and life and movies and, and mostly complain about the world burning um, as it does. Um, and then finding the, the joy in, in finding that uh, a poem or a line or the possibilities of the lyric and kind of literally shouting at each other when we discover it, we would literally call each other up and and say, look, look what I found or look what I've written. And I think that's, you know, it, it's, it's so important to me, but it's also um, emblematic of Peter Gizzi's um, poetics, which is ecstasy and a fearless gaze at sadness and and you know the loss and grief and the elegy quality um, is steeped in tradition and homage, which is something that is really important to me. Um, when I was a uh, a much younger poet as an undergrad at Brooklyn College, um, the only poetry class that was available was uh, Ben Lerner's class. He was I was there for a year, and then Ben was hired um, a year after. And uh, in office hours, Ben told me. Uh, you seem like an emotional poet. Um, and he recommended two writers. Uh, one was Kamal Brathwaite and the other was Peter Gizzi. And, uh, and he was right. You know, I, I felt like I found this sort of matrix in which um, there was so much discovery in feeling. Um, and the, the poem becomes an architecture in which it's mimetic of the ruptures of the world in these two poets. And, uh, you know, Ben immediately made me... Um, do uh, imitations of of, of, uh, of Peter Gizzi's book, Landscape. Um, so I, I've been a, a reader and a follower and um, now blessedly uh, a colleague. And uh, I, I feel really happy to see someone continue to write at such a high level um, so quickly and so faithfully um, and so robustly. Um, you know, it, every book is so different. I think that's what I wanna talk um, tonight about the various um, arcs and the stages um, of your career. Um, but you know, first we'll hear um, some, some of your poems um, to have them introduce us into the world and carry us forward. Um, but I just wanna say thank you everyone for being here. And uh, I feel really happy to share the night with you all. The stage is your captain. Thanks boss. Um, it's really lovely to do this. And Eric, thank you for having us and Ocean, it's always good to see you as we see each other all the time. I feel blessed by that. Um, so I thought I would begin with the first poem in my book, which is called Speech Acts for a Dying World. And I hadn't been writing, you know, despair happens to be one of the many menu items that I can pull down uh, in my personal operating system. And uh, I was despairing. It was the beginning of the Trump administration. Um, I'm still hung over from that. We all are. And I hadn't been writing for many, many months. And I thought maybe, well, you know, I don't, how do I speak into this? So when I began writing this poem, I began to realize maybe I'm writing a new book. And the poem is like an invocation. Um, it begins with a kind of muse. So the book is for my brother, Tom, also gone. And there's an epigraph by Jason Molina. I'll meet you where we survive. Speech acts for a dying world. A field sparrow is at my window tapping at its reflection. A tired antique God trying to communicate. It's getting to me as I set out to sing the nimbus of flora under a partly mottled sky. As I look at the end and sing, so what? Sing, live now, thinking, why not? I'm listening and receiving now, and it feeds me. I'm always hungry when the beautiful is too much to carry inside my winter, when my library is full of loss, full of wonder. As the polis is breaking and casts a shadow over all of me, thinking of it, 
When the shadows fall in ripples, when the medium I work in is deathless and I'm living inside one great example of stubbornness as my head is stove in by a glance, as the day's silver tip buds sway in union, waving to the corporate sky, when I said work and meant lyric, when I thought I was done with the poem as a vehicle to understand violence, I thought I was done with the high tone shitty world, done with a voice in its constituent path. Call down the inherited phenomenal world when it's raining in the book, lost to the world in an abundance of world, like listening to a violin when the figure isn't native, but the emotion is. When everything is snow and what lies ahead is a mesmer's twirling locket. I thought I was done with the marvel of ephemeral shadow play, the great design and all that. I thought I was done with time, its theatricality, glamour and guff. Gusting cloud, I see you. I become you in my solitary thinging here in partial light. When I said voice, I meant the whole unholy grain of it. It felt like paradise, meaning rises and sets, now a hunter overhead, now a bear at the pole, and the sound of names, the parade of names. And you begin to hear that the book, many of these poems speak and address the poem itself, that poetry became this particular act of you know, salvage. I don't say salvation, but salvage. And um, yeah, gave me courage. There's all these great side effects to being a poet. That I saw the light on Nonatuck Avenue. That every musical note is a flame native in its own tongue. That between bread and ash, there is fire that the day swells in crests, that I found myself born into it with sirens and trucks going by out here in a poem, that there are other things that go into poems, like the pigeon, cobalt, dirty windows, sun, that I have seen skin in marble, eye in stone, that the information I carry is mostly bacterial, that I am a host, that the ghost of the text is unknown, that I live near an Air Force base and the sound in the sky is death. That sound like old poetry can kill us. That there are small things in the poem, paper clips, gauze, tater tots, knives. That there can also be emptiness fanning out into breakfast rolls, macadam, stars. That I am hungry, that I seek knowledge of the ancient sycamore that also lives in the valley where I live that I call to it, that there are airships overhead, that I live alone in my head, out here in a poem near a magical tree, that I saw the light on Nunatuck Avenue and heard the cry of a dove recede into a rustle, that its cry was quiet light falling into a coffin, that it altered me. That today the river is a camera obscura bending trees, that I sing this of metallic shimmer, sing the sky, the song, all of it, and wonder if I am dying, would you come back for me? And I'm going to read one more short one before we start. This, is, this one is called, The Present is Constant Elegy. Those years when I was alive, I lived the era of the fast car. There were silhouettes in gold and royal blue, a half-light and tire marks across a field, times when the hollyhocks spoke. There were weeds in a hopescape, as in a painted backdrop there is also a face. And then I found myself, when the poem wanted me in pain, writing this. The sky was always there, but useless, and what of the blue flocks on stage and morphing? Chance blossoms so quickly, it's a wonder we recognize anything, wanting one love to walk out of the ground. Passion comes from a difficult world. I'm sick of twilight when the light is crushed. Time unravels its string. Along the way, I discovered a voice, a sun-stroked path choked with old light, a ray 
already blown. Look at the world, its veil. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing those poems to life that they've already lived so richly. Um, I heard what I feel is a sort of um, absolute thesis to so much of your work in that last poem. There were weeds in the hopescape. <laughs> that, 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 that acknowledgement of an alternative life, an alternative way of looking at the world um, in, in the naming, the new naming, Hopescape. It feels something like Salon could have written as well. Um, I, I, in, in Buddhism, we have this um, notion that one does not necessarily age by years, but by loss. Mm. Uh, th that we have this term called losing forward. And, and, and wisdom is gained through the measurement of what we lose, um, both people and things and portions of ourselves. Um, and, and I want to ask, uh, you know, how has your career surprised you in its, in, in its wide arc of these seven beautiful books? And particularly how does loss inform your creative practice and, and the lyric poem itself? Yeah, um, it's there. I believe that for me, sorrow is a useful lens in which to see the world. To me, it feels honest. I think grief is something we share, it's social. You know, the world is constantly grieving. There's so much sorrow, and I think that there's more sorrow in, there's more sorrow in beauty than there is beauty in sorrow. <clears throat> so what do I mean by that? Hmm. Okay, so when I say beauty, I don't mean surface. I mean the quote, beautiful, this idea of the beautiful, of the good. And I got that very early on. Um, studying ancient languages and um, the Greek idiom for citizen is kathe agathe, which simply means the beautiful and the good. And I've always taken that as a great measure for what it is to be a citizen, right? And to me, sorrow feels like a way to record the world's instabilities. I'm interested in recording the world's instabilities. So if my, phone, if my poems kind of like speak to that or seem a little like, you know, unstrung at times or <clears throat> reaching and there's a not knowing that's happening, I find that that's a really productive place to actually find reality and meaning. Beautiful. What I often hear in the poems is almost this undercurrent of an allegiance to poetry itself. Yeah. And it's, it's, I would argue that nearly all of your poems could be read as ars poeticas. Mm. That they are, in a way, this um, this testimony to its worth and value. Um, and of course, you you come out of, you know, in a way, um, an outsider tradition, even within an outsider art like poetry um, of the avant garde of the '80s and '90s. And then when I look at your selected book, you know, in defense of nothing. Um, you this, you this, destroyed that copy. <laughs> well, you being a book freak, yeah, go ahead. Well loved. Um, <laughs> um, I actually, you know, to me, I, I don't see nothing, and I think it's tongue in cheek um, uh, that title. Um, I, I, I replace it with poetry, you know, in defense of poetry. Now that's actually a really terrible title for a selected book of poetry. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't do it, but that's what I see, and I yeah. think I kind of knew, I, I felt that when reading it that, wait a minute, this is a defense of the art. Why does the art to you need to be defense, defended so perennially in your work? Well, I guess poetry is the ground in which I become to understand myself. Um, I mean, what are we really writing, Ocean, when we, when, we, when we write through the years? What we're building is personhood. I'm building my personhood. And that's a very big, um, experience it's a it's it's a large claim but it's also again one of these great side effects of poetry is that i've created a voice in which i can finally begin to understand myself and hear myself and hear myself in the world in relation to other things so poetry for me is how i've created this voice and this voice when i use the pronoun i which i'm fa which i favor i don't think of it as peter gizzy i think of it as because the i is so old and meaning it's much older than me, 
It's bigger than me. It doesn't really live in me. I live in it. We all do. And that pronoun is so wound and sprung with um, affiliated voices, with consciousness. So this is why, this is why um, I think the I, so when I say that I've built a personhood, it's me, but it's also built out of all of these affiliations when you talk about tradition. And that tradition does buoy me up, you know, because there's some days I despair, like, you know, some days, yeah, I do. But when I go to when I go to my library and I pull a book down and begin to read, all of a sudden I find myself, I'm kind of rescued by it. I mean, I tend to be a little dramatic, but it's actually that real, being on your knees and reading a poem. It's a form of prayer. Um, what was the other part of that question? No idea. Um, <laughs> you're taking me, I, I'm just gonna riff on what you said. I think, pre, I, 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 I recall um, John Berryman telling Merwin to go really in the corner and pray. And he meant it literally. literally. And, and uh, Merwin's kind of like, what do you mean? He's like, no, go in the corner, kneel down and pray. And I think a, a recent poet we lost, Jean Valentine, also sees, you know, when her work started to shift from the first book, from the Yale, that con the confessional style, and then she broke off into this sort of fragmented Sappho-like lyric, uh, you know, I think off of uh, Niedeker's influence. Um, she said, this is my prayer. This is the, you know, the there's a wing bone in the pencil. And I felt uh, so much of that in, in your own work and your allegiance to elders, um, which yeah. So I think I was raised, you know, strictly, very traditionally Vietnamese. I come from a right background. So elderhood um, was personhood. And, you know, if I can just read a little excerpt here, because we, I think- we love, we love that about you, by the way. <laughs> I love, okay, so here's a poem from um, Artificial Heart, early in your career, called Heart as Ash. And it goes, in an overcoat in winter, without socks, I wandered into night. One by one, all the bars fell into place. The day of the talking stones is no longer. The dreams of metamorphosis. The morning you woke up and for a moment forgot to call them dead. It was the morning of the poem. The subject is the content into which I step lovingly. This lapidary effect of all sunsets where houses invest the notions of home. Was that a good Im imitation of your cadence? <laughs> That's <pretty> good. <laughs> I tried. Um, well, an old chestnut. <laughs> no, but um, you're right. Poetry has been the ground for me. I mean, you know my early story and that I had to change my dissipating habits when I left New York. And, um, and I remember going to this bridge by the Housatonic River where I grew up in the Berkshires. And it was a, it's, a, it's a footbridge. And, I was newly off of narcotics and my body was just screaming. Um, and I remember just getting on my knees and asking the poetry gods to guide me. It sounds dramatic, but I actually did that. And um, it's carried me. And my work has evolved and changed, yeah. But poetry is the ground for me. I think so many poems that I love are about r and R's Poetica, right? I think of Dickinson's, you know, she says, this is, what does she say? She says, after a great pain, a formal feeling comes. And then she says, the feet mechanical go round or odd, a wooden way. But then she says, this is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived. She's talking about the poem. This is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived. And lead is both despondency, but for me, I hear pencil lead. This is the hour of lead. Yeah, exactly. You know, in this poem already early on, I see the homage. I see, you know, the course there, the morning of the poem, a nod to Schuyler. Um, but also I see a lot of the of Ashbery's work as well. And particularly this, what, what, what Ashbery took from Whitman, this transcendental you, this sort of amorphous personhood that could be, could be a container um, of other voices. And then from here, I see the Spicer, with the radio traditions. Can you talk a little bit about where you see the, the self as a conduit in this tradition? Um, because to me, it's an American tradition from the epicenter of Whitman, which is that all selfhood is up for mediation through language that, you know, I myself, right? Um, I contradict myself very well. I contain multitudes. And I think that 
is, is very present here in your work. And when you say the I is not necessary, Peter Kizzi, I also think of Rosemary Waldrop uh, when she says the you and the I are kind of modes, conduits uh, in, the, in which language as a current travels through, um, that it is both an articulation and an effacement. Um, as well, which is a very, to me, a very Buddhist concept still, mm -hmm. this, this effacement of a self. Um, can you talk about writing towards and away from a selfhood? Sure. Um, so I'm not interested in poems being about one thing. I want them to include many registers, right? Mm -hmm. and syntax connects me to you, but it also connects me to Donald Trump, right? It connects me to the glories of the world, the beloved, but it also connects me to the atrocities of the world. So there's so much already happening. What's the old linguistic joke? They say, you know, what's what is a what is a what is a language? A language is a dialect that has an army and a navy. So I've always been aware of the fact that I'm singing in this haunted language that has both the wish and prayer of um, liberty, but it's also deeply unrealized. So I'm interested in how I could insert like a piece of myself into that in the sense that, you know, I'm just a piece of the song, I'm just a piece of the poem. So autobiography comes in, it like I name check my brother Tommy in this new book, but the poem is also about many things. And so I want to have multiple registers because as we sorrow, as we lose, as we think, you know, there's all of these affiliated voices with us all the time. And I wanna find room for them because they've given me a voice. I'm I'm mad for um, poets. I mean, I feel like I'm just a class of worker that's been here for thousands of years, just next to the story. And I'm good with that because when I write, this is interesting, Ocean, when I write, I feel like I'm the right size. I'm mm. neither bigger nor smaller than anything. I am tuned with the world, and that can be the invisible world as well, you know. And you mentioned Ashbery, Schuyler, Spicer, Dickinson. These people, you know, they're they're enormous for me, and for different reasons. I think when I was younger, John Ashbery was a very clear influence. Um, he's just a remarkable poet of of you know asserting something and then digressing and digressing and digressing and where we start in this kind of thesis ends up somewhere else he does this again and again it's so rich but what i like about these poets we just particularly schuyler and ashbury is their generosity and their voice and that might be the whitmanic that you're speaking to i think if i as i've gone on i've become closer to the dickinson spicer matrix mm -hmm. you know um and where things are things Things don't connect, but they correspond. And <clears throat> to illustrate that, to illustrate that, no, I mean, I'm gonna read another poem, all right? Beautiful. And I'm gonna read this poem, the, the title poem called Now It's Dark. And I think it speaks to the fact that while I'm sorrowing, there are many things, there are many things involved. <clears throat> There's many things attendant to that. Now it's dark. All right, so I should say um, the other, a third of the book was written before my brother Tom, my older brother Tom, uh, became sick with ALS. And I was caring for him every day. And that was an incredibly sad, horrible journey. And what's amazing to me is that poetry was there for me. And it was a place where I could go. And I don't know how, I don't remember writing these poems, but um, again, it, it rescued me. Now it's dark, not the easiest day I'm having, clouds banking, and I drop my signal. I was trying to find my shoes and thought, I am overpowered by the gigantism of commercial governing. As I looked for my shoes this morning, the thought was, where am I going? There isn't a place I can walk out from under this chemical sky. So I thought I would write a poem. I thought I would try and make art. But the chemicals seep into everything. Reader, if I could, I would bring back for you a sun made in crayon, a sun unformed in the paper sky. I wonder the paper that made me. Being human, I know that paper makes my mind. Strange pulp reminding me I am far away. When my brother could no longer speak, I said, Tommy, I got this. Even if I don't want this, I'll sing for you. 
When my brother had no voice, there was only the couch and a wooden floor, the ceiling and the TV with nothing blaring. When my brother lost his voice, I lost my childhood, lost the sun over sand in some place I can't remember in Rhode Island summer. So far from myself in a body I can't remember. To no longer remember my body as a child, to no longer remember today all that was. Van Gogh was tormented by the sun, and why not? A constant blade searing light that kills and cures. I am not comforted by the cold stability of universal laws, but one day I'll die and think, that's okay. At least I'm writing, and it makes a party in the dark, a zombie feature that connects me to the undying. I read every moment is an opportunity for grace and think every moment is a possibility of art. I tie my shoes and now I'm standing alone in some inky light. Yesterday I passed a budget motel next to the People's Bank. If there's some connection, it's lost on me, my heart lost on me. Weather like thought dissolves into static, a wiggy keepsake like nesting dolls of my spiritual blank, sky opening into blank. I thought grief is a form of grace, and someone said the thing about money is that it's money. I live on the edge of an expanding circumference alone in some inky light. Now rain turns the world to constant applause. The day is uncoupled. All there is is thunder as the house decays into a sound like me. Freezing rain with silver seems to be speaking and isn't asking me anything, just doing its thing in the gray morning. I was down with materialism but wanted mystery. I've asked myself a lot of questions, like why the days cascade, swiping left for life, right for lost. All of it a dumb show, all of me invested in poetry and the arrogance of this, wanting to transpose <clears throat> loneliness. Why not take on the next life with its silence? On my desk, there are small plastic creatures. The light on them is unrealistic. It uncouples me. Or the sight of serious windows opening out onto serious lawns. This must be a government building. This must be the anodyne room of a hospital beeping. Every pronouncement on the feed, alien. I'm in this corridor, wandering a mind. But the day is past caring. The rhythmus is blooming at the beginning of the way back when. I am sick with tradition and its weak signaling. Sparkling eclogues drift and contribute little to the cause. I am an incident trapped in thick description. Just Google it. Dust jacket shows some rubbing. You're fine in cloth. So that poem's a little wiggy, right? Um, and it travels, but paper is, an, is, a, is a, um, a trope all the way through the book. Paper and books, yeah. I'm really happy to see your collection and your sort of connoisseur of rare books kind of get carried into this latest collection, this latest poems here. Because mm -hmm. when I read it, I, I smiled. I said, "Oh, this is he's a he's, a, he's so anal about paper and books." And he's finally showing it through here. Um, so it's really nice to see that. You know, I think something that folks rarely um, comment on when thinking th about your work. But it's something that is so prevalent in when we talk is class mm. uh, and your upbringing from a working class uh, immigrant Italian um, family. And, and I, I want to talk to you about how class informs your work. And I think so much of the lyric has been amplified by the by and, and, and innovated by class perspectives from Gwendolyn Brooks to Zukovsky, Niedeker. Um, and I'm curious of how your relation to it, because when I read your work, to me, I see a rooting for or um, an allegiance or a, an empathy for the underdog. And I think that's that's present in nearly all of your poems, that, that there's this rooting for the underdog. And I'm curious where that comes from. And I wonder how class informs that. Well, yeah, um, my father came from abject poverty and, um, found his rose through the world through his brilliance. Um, he was a scientist and um, he came from nothing and then worked his way up. But he was a very intense person, extremely serious, very strict, but also he loved me. Um, I lost him young, as you know. 
but those years really informed me. And basically his take on the world was one that was quite reasonable, right? Everybody matters. Everything matters. And there is no, there's, there is no looking down, right? It goes back to that idea of right sized, you know, and that also could have come through that early Catholic training that I was given, right? That was going to mass. Um, I was a very hyperactive child, but for whatever reason, I sat next to him and he took it so seriously that I knew something enormous was being claimed, even if I didn't quite, you know, follow it. Um, this notion of God, which to me becomes the night sky. That was how I defined it as a boy, that panoply overhead that was so reassuring and yet such a mystery. But it was listening to the liturgy. When I was a boy, it was in Latin and it was so beautiful. It was so remarkable. And it was for me, it was sound over sense. So sound for me is a way to transmit emotion, is a way to transmit the materiality of the world because sound is a thing, right? It's sculptural. It builds a room. It builds a dimension. We can live in it. And poets live in the sound, in our sound, in the sound of others. And um, so I, I, I think that it came from my father's very serious uh, decency. He was the kind of person that could make common decency thrilling. And I think that I was given some very important lessons. And I remember wanting something like a baseball mitt. And then we walked down the street and the next one I was given a paper route. So, you know, it was always like, yeah, it was, it, it was always rooted in, um, you know, if you want something, you have to work hard in the world and do it. You have to apply yourself. But more importantly, it was about the good. About And it goes back to what I was saying about citizen is the beautiful and the good. And I am aware of the underclass. I am aware. Yeah, I, it just, it, it's just, to me, it's the right way to be. I don't really consider it. It's just, it's, it's an important position to occupy and to relate to and to also speak through. That's what I love about you. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like when I, every time we hang out, I'm thinking about, we're looking at the same thing and you start saying exactly what I'm thinking, you know, especially when in relation to certain inequality or, you know, the charades that often are dictated by class. We, we cut through it all, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking of being in the bureaucracy of a, of an institution. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of winking at each other through all the meetings, but um, but you know, I never, I never just consider myself underclass. What I just thought I was, I was like everybody else. And until I got older, I was like, oh, I see, they have money, you know, yeah. right? But and it's um, the power structure, which is what we see in your work, you know, I'm looking for my shoes while being aware of the the, mm -hmm. the governing state. Um, you know, in 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 my in Vietnamese culture, we we preserve and we protect our elders in order to ask them the largest, hardest, most impossible questions, which so I'm gonna ask you a hard, impossible question. <laughs> That's a lot. I, I think recently, I, miss, I'm, I'm, I might be butchering the quote, but the critic Michael Silverblatt said something akin to, um, there has not, there has yet to be uh, a movement or poetics as um, radically open as the New York School. Um, that, that we're still waiting for something to replicate how expansive that is. And an interesting thing about those phrases is that they're so provocative and I like them because you can grapple with them. And, you know, with that in mind, I'm, I'm interested to think, where do you see poetry headed? You know, as someone who's seen so many decades of it, having written seven books, which is a, a rare achievement, especially at, at such a high level for any writer. Um, I, I would be blessed and lucky to to ever write seven books um, in any genre. Where do you think poetry is headed, and what excites you about the future of our of our practition? Well, people such as yourself, younger people. You know, when I was younger, I reached up, and now I I'm, and I'm surrounded by so many beautiful peers. I think of them all as peers. You know, I thought my friendships with elder poets, um, my own generation, younger poets. I think we're all part of a continuum. Um, where do I think poetry is going? That that I can't really in, in necessarily speak to other than the fact that poetry has exploded in the world. There's many poetries. Um, I, I embrace all the various positions if it's good, right? I mean, I don't care how someone writes or where they write from or how it writes. If, if the poem 
if, if the object of the poem, if the art is there, right? I'm not interested in narrative or, or story or autobiography per se, unless that person do it with great skill, right? Um, but I do think that there's a lot of narrative in poetry now, and it's interesting to me. My students are interested in it, and um, I can accommodate that. And But I, I'd also like to ask them, to what happens when you remove some of yourself from the poem and take things away and then let the enlarge the poem, to dilate it? And that what happens is the poem becomes bigger, but the voice of the author becomes bigger. If the voice of the author becomes bigger, their personhood is bigger. So I find that editing is the place in which I can I can really um, get in get into that, get up inside the piece of writing and open it up to, you know, to dilate to a larger dimension. But what I'd like to see, and I guess it's only because I have years on you, the thing for me for writing, when I was younger, I was louder. I was closer to the song. But in the last decade, uh, since Threshold Songs, Archaeophonics, in this book, the voice is further away. It's like it's on the other side of the river. And you talked about elegy, that periodicity of understanding that we're not here for very long. You know, we're not, we're, we're, it's, we're gone so much more than we're here. So um, that, that vision of the here and the not here is now just seems native to me. Um, so I feel like I'm in this conversation with me and then on the other side with being gone. Now that sounds crazy and strange and I can't quite uncomb it, but that's kind of where it is. And I feel comfortable by pitching the voice over there and it's a place that I can go it's, and I can inhabit it. And what I'm inhabiting is the voice of the poem and what, and what it's dictating to me. And- um, Well, you said in archaeophonics, I'm visiting this voice. Yeah, I'm just visiting this voice. It's a beautiful sentiment, I think it's so accurate. For my last question, what has been the biggest surprise of, 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 of your career, of your writing life? And you can't say that I'm still here because I know you say that often. <laughs> I'm not dead yet, that's what I like to say. Um, the biggest surprise is that this particular art form has furnished my entire imagination, that it's given me a context, a community, it's helped me negotiate crises, both publicly, politically, and personally. It's given me a ground, it's given me a lens to finally understand reality, not like, not the reality, but a reality. And that's what I'm interested in, like that honesty of a reality of how the world comes to me and then how I can, how I arrange it to make meaning, to recognize myself. So I guess the greatest gift it's given me is a way to enlarge myself and become in some ways uh, more awake. I'm constantly becoming awake and I'm becoming awake in the new work that's being written. I like this idea of being, you know, up for the job and that I've somehow found a way to honor what I've been given by quote, my elders, you know, that th I was given so much when I was young by so many people. I'm not gonna start name, but it's just, I, I can't even believe my story that these things, these gifts that I was given and from that, I feel like, without being any way hubristic, that I've honored what I've been given. And I feel feel um, lucky. I feel grateful for that. But there's still so many places I need to go, you know? Yeah. Well, um, we're, we're lucky to have you, Peter. And, and we're lucky you're here. Um, would you close us out? Yeah, I will. I will. Thank you, Ocean. So weird seeing you on screen, but that's okay. Um, this is the last poem of the book, and it's the coda. The book's in four sections, and this is the coda, the final poem. And I wrote this one uh, near the final days of my brother, it turns out. And when I finished this poem, he passed the next morning. From this end of sadness, a particular blur attended my mind from end to end. 
these feelings of futurelessness, to free fall into it. It feels like winter, the light overcast and the day lit up from within. To find a line in it, I found a world torched into renewal, blackened stalks pointing skyward. I took fortification from goneness. At this end, the notation is green. No stopping music entering air and tearing air. The songs were old songs. They came with the wren and the robin, also the crow so dear to reality and elegy and traffic, its essential din, the synesthesia of the din. From this end of sadness, I identified the voice as dead. It was companionable. I identified sky turning topaz. I did not understand shadows, did not understand luminosity. I did not understand the code that held me to the world. From this end, glistening leaves, cool air. Wandering out into it, wandering through it, the day crumbles to dust inside a blue dahlia. I am that dust in dahlia. I am coeval with the rotting trunk and the pine needles regenerating soil. I am happiest with the forest floor, branches listing under a porcelain sky. I'm into that medieval light glancing through leaves. The tree's arches are a great kingdom now. From this end of sadness, there's nothing out there I want and wonder if there's anything in here I need. I'm into the way the technology of an eye is filled with the dead. I'm heavy with light when the old sun is speaking, when I'm not sure the day is real, when it's hard to be in it and of it, to be here with it and under it. From this end of sadness, shapes come, all the boldest shadows. From this end, animals, the oldest eyes, the cri de cour, afternoons hung with seeping light. Poor sun waiting to die, poor sun solo in space, fueling our heads, a tiny sun in the mind. Right now, a particle decays on the lawn. From this end, gravity decays in the mind. To never forget the corners and dust bunnies of the laughing sun. But if the song weren't a bright star hanging in the firmament, then what can be said for burning embers in the fire? I see you turning and bending there in the cold dream of the past, braiding with the now of blur. Blur with me when I am sick of dying, fearful of failing the song I love. Be with me whenever I sit wasting days. Comfort the hours. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, it's 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 always a pleasure to see you and hear your work, and it's it's an honor to to share and and to witness what you've been able to do. I always look forward to everything you do, and it's really nice to just, you know, you're right. It's like the poems are written by us, but in a way, we 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 immediately step out of the way and kind of look at them with bewilderment. Bewilderment's good. What happened? Well, Who are you? <laughs> we're all, we're always narrating our bewilderment as citizens. I think you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but just to finish, just quickly, Philip Gustin has a beautiful thing. Um, it's in this new book. Or it's an old book, but it's new to me. This Ross Feld book that my friend Richard Kraft turned me on to. And Gustin says, when you enter the studio, you're there with your friends, your mentors, your critics, you know, the masters. He said, but as you begin to paint one by one, they walk out of the room. And he said, when you're really painting, you walk out of the room. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Beautiful. All right. Well, let's welcome Eric back um, for a few comments. Um, thank you both so much. What an extraordinary uh, almost hour we've had together. And uh, people listening have been uh, emoting very heavily uh, because I think uh, they feel how uh, you, you all touched on generosity, but I think they feel that actually that is present in the conversation. Uh, your friendship and respect and generosity and love of poetry has, has been um, uh, here in the rooms, in all our rooms with us, uh, and, and that brings joy. I, I, we have a million questions and really no time for any, but I think I, I want to bring just one because I think it was phrased beautifully and and uh, uh, and I, and I think people may, may need your answer. Um, and uh, uh, the question that someone asks out there is, uh, what is bringing you rebellious joy at this time? Hmm. Well, 
I think of the poem as an act of rebellion against the prose of the world. I think it's a way to speak back into the despicable times we're living in. Just like I was mourning and going through the things with my brother, the poem gave me a way to push back, to survive. You know, the poem is an act of survival. And I think that's a form of rebellion. I mean, am I throwing rocks at the Capitol? No. Um, but I believe that we rebel in different ways. And, and so I always loved what William Carlos Williams says in the beginning of The Wedge, his 1944 book during the Second World War. He says, the war is the first and only thing today. The arts generally are not. Nor is this writing a turning away for relief. It is the war, merely a different sector of the field. And I think that's where we live. And we're, 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 we're rescuing you know, the invisible world. And that could be the underclass, it could be, and it could be many things, yeah. Thank you. Ocean, any thoughts? Oh, rebellious joy. Um, in a very practical sense, I think sometimes I wake up and I just, I, I'm, I'm awed that I can make a living teaching and writing uh, poems. Um, most of my family are are still working in factories and I become in a way like a, a central government. I give out the COVID checks. I can take care of my family through this art that is still so bewildering to me, to, so bewildering to the popular zeitgeist in a sense. Um, and I, I think I'm looking forward to my brother moving in this weekend. He's been floating around um, since our mother passed uh, two years ago. And um, it's nice to kind of like embrace and then like I'm able to to do that, you know, to have a life um, because I, I, I risked everything, you know, I, to drop out of business school and deciding, OK, I, if all of my heroes were poor to do what, you know, I was reading the biographies of Lorca and Rambo and they say, if all my heroes were poor anyway, I'll bite the bullet and do it. And somehow, you know, in, in this ironic twilight zone twist of fate, I now can support my family, which is huge, you know, for me. Um, and so be, being able to, to have a room now in my house for my brother to move in after the biggest loss of our lives, um, it, it gives me a lot of joy. You know, I, I, it's, it feels like a rebellion to me because I can never imagine it. I can never perceive being able to make space for those I love using an art that is so ephemeral that could barely be traced, you know, like if if our world is burning as it has been, um, if our archives are gone, if our internet is shut down, we, will, we would lose the relics of it and it would have to be carried. Um, and so it is so untenable. Um, and yet with that, uh, I've been able to literally have a warm room for my little brother. So that feels like a rebellion to me. Yeah, Nikki, he's, he's a good kid. And I'm the one that has to talk to him about cars because you don't. <laughs> Can't drive, so I would call Peter. Said Peter, can you come talk to my brother about these brakes or something? <laughs> so, so thanks, thanks for being my car bro. Yeah, there you go. Car bro for hire. <laughs> well, you have you have uh, both brought incredible joy to hundreds of listeners tonight. Um, uh, it's negative something degrees here in Minneapolis, but it feels like summer in our hearts. Thanks to you. Uh, we wish you well. We wish all our readers, please get this wonderful you, ocean. books. Uh, thank you all. Be good to each other and good night. Thanks, Eric. Our pleasure.